Congratulations, class of 2016. I'm truly thrilled to speak at your convocation. I've never convoked anyone before. <laughs> before I was asked to speak to you, if you'd asked me what a convocation was, I would have said it was something you could major in at Hogwarts. <laughs> Divination, convocation, potions. Uh, second off, I would like to apologize for not being Matt Damon. <laughs> this is sort of a blanket apology for my whole life, actually. I apologize for all the choices that I've made at all points that led to my not being Matt Damon now, <laughs> as at all times. And uh, third off, I, since being asked to speak, I've slowly begun to panic that you were all under the misapprehension that I was some sort of health expert. I am not. All I know is that you can probably not take your temperature with your phone. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I have lupus, <laughs> if WebMD is right. Everything else I know about the health industry, I learned from Grey's Anatomy, <laughs> which is to say that I think most of your job is just being in montages. <laughs> like you have a ponytail, but your hair also keeps getting in your face a little bit, and you stand in the doorway, and there's a ukulele cover of Somewhere Over the Rainbow that starts playing <laughs> as you realize who it is you truly love. And the little boy smiles wistfully up at you from his bed where he's hooked up to all the tubes, and you smile back, but wistfully. And then the next room, someone's giving birth. And you walk down the hallway, and your ponytail swings wistfully. If there's more to it than that, please don't tell me. Or based on house, I assume most of medicine is like, you think it's one thing, but then it turns out it was another different thing. And in the process of realizing this, the patient flatlines several times. And there's also a subplot where the man who's accidentally poisoned himself by eating too many carrots and Lisa Cuddy sighs and folds her arms and is like, oh, you. <laughs> so I thought, well, maybe I can quickly Google all the things you spent four years learning so that I can sound knowledgeable when I talk about it. But then I thought, well, if you wanted an inaccurate 10-minute lecture from somebody who literally knows nothing about what you spent four years studying, you would just be a woman and go to a cocktail party. <laughs> but. It's not just that I'm not an expert in health sciences. I barely know how to be a person. When people write think pieces about you, I'm included. I'm not that much older. I'm at the age where your friends start getting bangs and you know that means they're gonna have them for the rest of their lives. <laughs> and where people you know start having kids on purpose and everyone around them is like, yes, this is correct and good. <laughs> I'm at the exact age when you start to realize there's no orientation program for being an adult, which is distinct from college, which is not an orientation program for adulthood, obviously, because it teaches you things like how to use your iron to make toast, and how to get vomit out of grout, and how to make it look like you're not using lecture to stealth watch cocktails with Chloe. Useful skills that don't really apply to actual life. But honestly, no one who's ever seen my apartment would ask me for advice. They would say, why is your toaster in your clothes closet? And I would be like, look, I panicked, all right? People were coming over and I panicked. <laughs> Panic is, panicking is actually both my hobby and my profession. I work at a newspaper, I write about the election. So I spend most of my time staring at a screen and panicking. It's just like Spotlight. I'm basically Rachel McAdams in the sense that I wear ill-fitting clothes and whenever my grandmother reads one of my articles, it upsets her. Also, my handwriting is terrible. I recently interviewed a man, and I know he did not say, hot damn, you ulcers. <laughs> but I am not sure what he did say. <laughs> this is my only area of overlap with medicine, so I'm clinging to it. <laughs> Your dean kindly suggested that since I've been covering the election, I should talk about how the health sciences will be affected by various candidates. And my immediate response was, well, I have good news your skills will still be relevant in the event of a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> Which is why I'm excited to be speaking to you, because it's rare that you get to talk to a group of people whose skills would still be useful if civilization were overrun by zombies. If I sprained my knee running from a zombie, physical therapists could tell me what home exercise program to forget to do. 
there would still be speech and language pathology jobs. Other people hear zombies going brains, and you say, hey, that's got a voice labial stop and a fricative in it, and also a diphthong and a nasal. I hope, I Google this. We can work with this. And the nutritional science folks and dietitians will be like, maybe don't just eat brains. And the occupational therapist can get asked, so you help people with their resumes, right? <laughs> but I didn't mean to draw a direct line between the election and the zombie apocalypse. It's not necessarily a direct line. I just, the more closely you follow the show, the more you feel like the groundwork is definitely being laid for one. Like if there isn't a zombie apocalypse, it will be a cop-out on the part of the writers. But in all seriousness, you know a great deal more than I do about very many much more useful things. And I'm not certain what advice I can give you. Since I've been staring up at the glass case filled of election, I think maybe the most helpful thing I can say is actually the world is not literally on fire. Because the number one thing people ask you when you follow it at all is, are things as bad as they look? Is everything literally on fire? Because for a while, Ted Cruz was going around literally telling small children that the world was on fire. And when you have an actual major party candidate suggesting that the world is physically aflame, you begin to worry. Is it? And if I were graduating, this would definitely be my concern. I'd be like, why do all the calendars expire in November? <laughs> now, I realize the worst way to reassure people that things are actually OK is to be too specific. We're fine, sounds fine. Grandma didn't break her hip, is terrifying. It's like, well, what did she break? What actually happened? You say, look, the important thing is there aren't mutant killer rats in the house today. <laughs> and everyone's like, what, what was happening yesterday? <laughs> what kind of rats are there? It's all in the inflection. So I realized it's less than reassuring to say, well, it probably won't be a zombie apocalypse. The world's not on fire. But since so much of the current campaign season and news cycle and life in general consists of people trying to tell you that everything's aflame, the reassuring good news is that we've pretty much always been due for an apocalypse as long as human beings have been around. In a strange way, there's nothing we've believed longer or more fervently than that the world is about to end. It will end in fire or in ice or in Y2K. The Mayan calendar had it ending in 2012, but it didn't. Harold Camping thought it was going to end in 2011, but it also didn't. The Millerite sect in the 19th century thought it was going to end on March 21st, 1844, but then it didn't. And their leader said, well, how about October 22nd, then? Is that better for you, Apocalypse? But it also didn't end on October 22nd, 1844, which was very awkward for his Celt who'd all sold their possessions. And so far, literally everyone who said that the world is about to end has been wrong, except for that one dinosaur. But in general, when people tell you the world is on fire, it's safer not to believe them. Not because things aren't terrible, because things often are terrible. But they're not on fire yet. They're very seldom on fire. And the same goes for people who tell you that you're living in the worst possible time and that things used to be way better and people used to be made of gold and perfect and stand as tall as buildings. People have also thought this for as long as there have been people. The ancient Greeks believed they were living in the Iron Age that followed the Age of Gold, the Age of Silver, the Age of Bronze, and the Age of Heroes. They were way down there in the Fifth Age. People have been complaining that the father doesn't agree with his children, the children don't agree with their father, brothers aren't kind to brothers, Par children dishonor their parents, and they carpet them, chide them with bitter words, not knowing the fear of the gods. They praise the evildoer and his violent dealing. And this is from like the 750s BCE. This is Hesiod. And I was at a Trump rally not too long ago where I spoke to a man and I asked him why he was supporting Trump and he said, well, it was because men used to not work out, but they had abs and perfect teeth and they looked like movie stars and that families used to have dinner on Sundays and it was a day of rest and now we're all stuck in the rat race. And also he hadn't had beats, just regular beats in a long time. <laughs> and I was like, you should talk to Hesiod. <laughs> because as long as there have been people, we've been maintaining that things used to be way better, but they weren't. And that everything's on fire, 
is about to be on fire, or has always been burning since the world's been turning, even. <laughs> but they're not. And saying they're on fire is a cop-out. It means you don't have to save anything. You don't have to work on anything. You just get to watch the world burn, tear it all down, feel the burn, but not in the fun topical election way. <laughs> it's fun to scare people, but reassuring them is harder. And I think you know that, given what you've chosen to do. Because the one way the world actually does end is on a small level for actual people every day. It's ending when a kid can't make himself understood, or when your hip stops working and you can't climb stairs. And that's the only way it ever ends, is one person at a time. And the only way you stop it from ending is one person at a time. And that's true, even if it's the zombie apocalypse. Although in that case, you should probably run. Thank you and congratulations.